Good evening, and welcome to the candidate debate for the 5th Senate District of the Connecticut General Assembly. This is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and WHC-TV. We are pleased to bring you this nonpartisan voter service for the 2016 election with the cooperation of the respective parties. My name is Deb Polin of the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford, and I will be your moderator this evening. The debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format. This format is designed to enable candidates to freely elaborate on their approaches to a variety of issues, unimpeded by the strict time constraints of a more traditional debate. Each candidate will have a total of 10 minutes of response time during the debate. When speaking, each candidate is timed by a League of Women Voters timekeeper. Periodically, the timekeepers will hold signs up for the candidates, indicating the amount of time remaining. Candidates are encouraged to rebut and sir rebut responding to their differences as they perceive them, understanding that the clock is running. Each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. The order of precedence for speaking was determined by lottery. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the candidates who have committed their time and energies to this important aspect of the democratic process, running for elective office. First, we have Mark Merritt. Mark is a husband, father of three, community volunteer, and an experienced financial professional. Mark has spent his entire career in the financial services industry, currently serving as Managing Director of Relationship Strategies for Nationwide Financial. At Nationwide, he oversees multi-product relationships for the financial institutions division, serving banks, national broker dealers, and regional firms. As a 22-year resident of West Hartford, Mark has always taken pride in giving back to the community. Mark has been a volunteer coach with the West Hartford Little League since 2004, active with youth soccer and basketball programs in town, and is a member of the West Hartford Republican Town Committee. He also is a member of the Finance Committee Board of the Emanuel Synagogue. Mark and his wife, Michael Lee, have three children, Hannah, Benjamin, and Adam. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And next we have Beth Bai. Beth Bai is currently the state senator for West Hartford, Farmington, Burlington, and Bloomfield. Prior to that, she served in the State House and on the West Hartford Board of Education. Beth is particularly proud of her efforts to build Bristow Middle School while on the Board of Education and of fighting for state funding to build the new Charter Oak School, which opened this fall. She has worked in early childhood education as director of the School for Young Children and Trinity College Child Care. She helped develop Wintonbury Early Childhood Magnet School. She is currently the director of the 4-H Education Center at Our Farm. Beth moved to West Hartford to raise her family here. She and her wife, Tracy, have five children. The quality of schools, economic climate, our engaged community, and the quality of life make it a great place to raise a family, top 15 in the nation. She is honored to be part of the many town and state policies that support these kinds of rankings. Beth has been engaged in the community for many years. She coached baseball and basketball in town and has been active in the UU Church on Fern Street. She is also an avid bicyclist and has worked to make cycling safer in town and statewide. She plays tennis, skis, and loves to cook and entertain. Welcome. Thanks. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. And by order of lottery, we've decided that the first question is going to go to Mark Merritt first. And let's kick things off by talking about the state budget and some fiscal issues. That's a very popular topic, and we know that the state has been facing some budget challenges. Given those budget challenges, what do you believe is the appropriate balance of program cuts and tax increases? Well, Deb, thank you and the League of Women Voters for being here today and, uh, and Beth as well. Uh, part of the budget process and one of the things that I wanted to, uh, why I decided to run for our state senate here is because of where we are from a fiscal perspective. I think one of the things that we've done over the last number of years is, you know, need to prioritize, but we're doing it from year to year. I look for having a, maybe a longer term horizon so it makes it easier for us to make decisions about what needs to be funded and what we'll have to wait and put those in priority because with the revenue that we're trying to generate here in the state is actually on the backs of all the residents which is the state is driving revenue through taxes and so how do we get more of a tax um, benefit to all the residents as well as looking at things how we can spend that money and what's the benefit for them the government should actually spend money on resources for health care for um, 
citizens that can't afford the health care and do a lot of number of things there that they cannot afford. So part of it is on the budgeting process and what we should spend is what is central, what is what needs to happen, and what are some of the things that we need to look at from a longer term perspective and budgeting from a longer term perspective, not just a short term going from year to year. And that's that where I feel that we've been at right now. Yeah. Uh Thank you for the question. Thank you to League of Women Voters and the Timers and, and Mark for being here uh, tonight. I think uh, what's happening in Connecticut is we're having a difficult recovery from a financial services recession, and we are a state dependent on financial services. So uh, with a meltdown that happened um, because of some bad behavior, um, the whole country's been affected, but Connecticut has been affected particularly uh, because of this. And so we're always slow out of a recession, and right now we're slower than ever because of that. So we've had to pivot, and we've had to make investments in things like bioscience with our budget to develop some of the upcoming sectors to get our economy going again. And it's taken five years, but we're finally there. We're back to um, employment levels in the private sector. About 97% of the jobs have been recovered. Um, but the challenge is, with the state budget, the revenues have been slow to come in. We have cut billions, really, over $4 billion out of the state current services over the past five years. It's been a very difficult time where, as Mark talked about, we have some vital services that we have to fund. We have to fund um, families that have people that have children with developmental disabilities. They need housing. We have to fund health care for our seniors. Um, so we still have those budget strains, but the revenues were down. And so um, with that, we, we had to make some difficult cuts while trying to protect the safety net. So it's been a difficult time for our state. So let's so, talk a little bit more about this and figure out uh, if you had to raise taxes or cut programs, what would you choose to do? Right. I mean, so our industry in the state of Connecticut actually has recovered about 90 percent, 97 percent of the, um, the jobs that we lost in 08 and 09. Mm -hmm. But the region you look at has increased their job growth by over 100%, mm -hmm. over 115, 120%. We look at the numbers from a number of different uh, areas that they show that we're lagging behind that. So what are some of the things that we can do to drive that is, you know, looking at fundamentally the budget structure that we have. So your question is about fundamentally changing, raising taxes. I will pledge I will not raise, raise taxes. I mean, that's one of the options we cannot be doing right now in 2011, 2015. We raise taxes as we're coming out of a recession. And that kind of put us back in more of a hole. And from all the economics that you see here every day with the papers, it's one of those things that it drove us down a little bit further than where we need to be. And that's why we lag some of our competitors in Rhode Island, New Hampshire, in New York even as well, is creating jobs. So that was kind of one of the things that we probably may have put us in a bad spot by raising those taxes in 2011, 2015, and not helping our employers grow some of those businesses and investing in their jobs. Yeah, I, I would say one of the really important things we did do is we didn't bounce a budget on the backs of our property tax owners. In other states, New York, New Jersey, some of the other states you mentioned, they cut aid to cities and towns. And in Connecticut at the legislature, we said we cannot do that because we know it's going to be the homeowners who bear the burden. And in Connecticut, we spend a lot on our schools. And when you cut property, when you cut aid to cities and towns, you're necessarily either cutting school aid right. or you're increasing property taxes. So I think the budget has been difficult, but that's been because we've refused to cut that $2 billion item that is aid to cities and towns. And when you include roads and other items, it's even higher than that. So um, that's been the challenge, uh, is that we felt like we couldn't cut those things uh, that make Connecticut, Connecticut, because our communities are what makes us special. In the town of West Hartford, people live here because of the quality of life the quality of the schools, and I was up there fighting to maintain that funding um, and not pass it on to the property tax owners. Right, and the challenge that the towns have, though, is the not the predictability of the funds that they're going to receive from the state year in and year out. They have to, you know, it's a wing and a prayer sometimes as to what's happening from year to year. So I, I guess the question would be is why can we not put a three to five year budget plan together and kind of live within those means? Because right now what we're doing is we're borrowing and spending a lot of money um, that we have to pay at some particular point in time because we're looking at things from a year-to-year -year perspective. So even in the town of West Hartford, they have to put together a couple of budgets here and not knowing what funding and what level. We're going to get some level of funding, right. but what, to what level can they re rely well, on? Well, I think we've been very reliable. In fact, funding in the 5th District towns has increased every year in the past three years. So uh, we have tried to be reliable to the towns. 
they come to us and say, help. You know, Farmington will call and say, please come listen to us. We go meet with the town council about the critical investments that they need. And the same thing happens in West Hartford. And what we do in Connecticut is we put together a two-year budget, but we make projections five years out. And so when we were making the difficult cuts this year, we were saying, okay, what's the impact? What are the kind of cuts that are going to make a structural difference? So in five years from now, we'll be better off and we won't be back at the table making these difficult, difficult cuts again. But I think the key is to get our economy going to keep growing our bioscience industry and innovation and technology industries because right now uh, that's where the growth is happening and we need to really support those small businesses and those entrepreneurs who are ready to start small businesses in Connecticut. We need to get the growth industries growing and then that brings in the revenue and that helps the budget. We've got to get the economy going. Understood. And then part of the thing, Beth, is you know, we also put a 20% surcharge on a, on a business that becomes successful. Over a certain revenue number, they are now charged 20% surcharge. So it gets from a 7% tax rate to a 9% tax rate if you become successful. You know, is there a way that we can actually limit, they, limit eliminate that 20% surcharge so they can reinvest in their business to hire well, more employees? Well, I think over the past, say, 15 years, uh, the business taxes in Connecticut have come down. And more and more, we're relying on the income tax, on the average taxpayer, uh, to give those cuts. So um, I, I would certainly look at that particular surcharge, and I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Yeah. And part of it, too, is if you look at some of the, the caps in spending, too, the also it's been out there that we had the income tax 25 years ago. How do we, you know, live within our means? And so how do we, with the budget, the borrowing and spending, you know, we have that caps that should have been put in place. Are, would you be willing to put that forth? And yeah, I spent about that? 12 hours today debating the spending cap uh, down at the Capitol and really listening to some experts um, about that. And I think it's important that we have a spending cap that works for Connecticut versus one that, that keeps getting changed because of the predictability of that. Um, so uh, that would be my answer there. Great. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about encouraging the development and the success of small businesses. You mentioned small businesses. We know that they're a key to economic success in our state. What are some specific ideas that you have, and we'll start with you, Beth, to encourage the development of small businesses? Well, uh, we, we have a program called the Small Business Express uh, that we started a number of years ago. It was a bipartisan effort uh, to give small loans and to give um, uh, grants to small businesses that want to expand. For example, BK and Company just received one because of a change. They had to move. It was a thriving business, but they had a big challenge. Um, Hartford Baking Company uh, wanted to expand. Um, so if you can show that you are going to grow your business and add jobs, you get a short-term boost from the state to get going. And this has really, in my, in not, just in the 5th District, 58 companies have benefited from these grants, and we've gained or retained 700 jobs. So it's not a permanent help, but it's saying we believe that if we invest in small businesses, that's where a lot of the growth is going to come for the future. So I think, um, again, when we get together, Democrats and Republicans come up with a plan. Small Business Express is a really good example of that bipartisan working together to grow our economy. Mark, what do you think about the Small Business Express program, or do you have any other well, ideas? Um, with regards to the small businesses, what it gets down to is also the mandates that we put down on the business owners as well uh, for a lot of these folks. And it makes it tough for them to, to get out from underneath and start growing their business. So I think it's a very good program that's happened. I think there's a couple of other programs that have happened in the state to help small business owners get there. But then we also put a lot of red tape through them. We make, we make them with regards to the uh, unemployment insurance, the process that they have to go through for that. They also have for the unpaid sick leave and that we put more on top of what is already done on the federal level with doing that. Just recently, the new legislation with regards to the Department of Labor allowing states to um, create their own 401k type program. Now that will mandate small business owners that they would have to do this for more of a payroll opportunity for them. They would have to, it's more costly for them for their payroll to now put into this plan when it goes into place. And so, but the state would be managing it through a quasi agency. So those are things that we need to help alleviate some of those concerns for those small business owners so they can invest, so they can go from 700 jobs uh, to 1,000 jobs and more high paying wage jobs. So that's kind of what we need to be looking at for those type of solutions and, and working together bipartisan. There has been a lot of things that have been talked about um, working together, and so a lot of things that we see as residents is we don't see that working together. And so I'd love to be able to bring that because that's what I do for a living, and bring in trying to find other solutions for small business owners. Um, so that's you know those are a couple of things that we'd have to look at and really work towards on helping reduce their mandates. All right, let's move on to education. As a state, 
do you believe that we are matching our skills and resources at the various levels of education to effectively serve the needs of students and businesses now and into the future? You know, I think for our state, you know, the education has been forefront as a result of the uh, the ruling that came down. But, you know, as you mentioned, I have three kids. I have one that has gone through and graduated the system and is now a freshman in college. And I still have two children in the system. And that's one of the reasons why Mike Lee and I moved here is because of the education that's provided here in West Hartford and, and in the district itself. And I think we are preparing for the most part in our state for kids to be prepared to move on. I think there's some other parts of the state that we need to help and support. Um, but we have other areas that are doing really well, and like here in West Hartford, fantastic school system. And again, that's one of the reasons why we moved here, and we have them going through the system. So uh, it's important. It's, we'll have to see what happens with the ruling and everything that goes through with it. But as you know, with three ki two kids still left in the system, it's very important to me as well, and what I see uh, day in and day out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Connecticut is consistently ranked in the top five states in the country for its education system, for the number of kids in preschool. Um, it's been a priority, and it it's one of the most important things to keep our economy moving forward. I think we've made some important steps uh, to match our education system with the jobs that are here. We made a huge investment at UConn to increase the number of engineers because Electric Bro Boat and Pratt came to us and said, we're not going to have enough engineers, so what are you going to do about it? So we sat down with them. We made a huge investment at UConn that we c get criticized for sometimes, but that is paying off in spades. I see a lot of uh, West Hartford grads going to be engineering majors at UConn. I know they're going to get out. I know there are going to be jobs here in Connecticut for them. So we try to listen. When Electric Boat says this is what we need, we fixed it. A lot of small manufacturers came to us about five years ago and said, we don't have the talent coming out of high school. So um, working with them, we opened four manufacturing technology programs. And now we're trying to get the message to the middle schools and the high schools that they're really great jobs in manufacturing because uh, Connecticut and that precision manufacturing, those are good paying middle class jobs. No, they are. They are. And so there's a number of companies in Farmington that do laser Absolutely. manufacturing. And so how do we educate our folks to be able to step in and be those uh, next employees for those type of companies. It's critical. And on-the-job training and doing a lot of things there, working with internships and creating that at an early level, I think is good. And that's probably one thing that Beth and I will agree on mm -hmm. a lot of stuff is the education, how important it is, but looking at new initiatives to help drive that further for these folks. Great. Let's talk a little bit about the environment. What, if any, is the state's role in combating climate change and promoting a better environment for people's health? And uh, this question goes to you first, Beth. Well, I mean, Connecticut, again, is always in the top 10 for our environmental quality. It's been something our residents have fought for. And I think we have a very responsive government that when people come up there and say this is a problem, uh, they stick up for it. I think every state has a role. Uh, we need to look to improve our energy infrastructure to have more green technology, more solar, uh, more wind. Um, we also need to improve our grid uh, to make it easier to move power in the region, um, but I think we have a big role, and it's, it's electric cars, it's solar, it's incentives to help people uh, use less energy and to use cleaner energy, and there's more we can do, uh, but we've done a lot in Connecticut over the past decade. No, absolutely. I think we, uh, Mother Nature provides us abundant of opportunities, and how do we harness that? And how do we harness it responsibly um, in, in providing for employee, uh, for residents as well as business owners? You know, the Green Bank, as well as working mm -hmm. on the solar thing, that's probably been a very good example of what's happened at the state. We need more of those to happen. We need to make that investment in those type of things to help folks, but we need to do it responsibly. Yeah. And a lot of times we can't do it all at once, but we need to manage it appropriately. And I'm all for that. I mean, we look at it now and look at different al alternatives. A number of years ago, it was a very small percentage of our power in, the, in doing that from the environment perspective. Now it's getting a lot more opportunities for doing that, and you're investing that, and how we're investing better with technologies. So, uh, I mean, I look forward to more opportunities with doing that in the environment. Yeah, and so, I think there are ways to tie that to jobs as well, that we use these engineering programs we have at our private and public schools and try to uh, get more patents. I mean, Connecticut consistently has some of the most patents in the country. We have an innovative a system of education that promotes and uh, gives us a lot of innovators. And so how do we turn that into new businesses in the state that are helping both global warming and growing jobs here in Connecticut? All right. Let's talk a little bit about the cost of health insurance. Um, the rate increases in health insurance have been quite large uh, despite the Affordable Care Act. And there have been some fiscal struggles uh, associated with Connecticut's co-op plan, Healthy CT. Do you believe that Connecticut should take a larger role in ensuring the affordability of health insurance for its residents? 
uh, why or why not. And uh, this goes to you, me. Mark. Yeah. Well, um, I'm all for a more of an open market type philosophy and allowing competition to happen and driving down those costs. And we do need to help the folks that are not able to have health, health insurance and make it affordable for them. But to having a one payer system and a one option, we need to more, have it open up to be more competitive in driving down marketplace uh, costs for everybody. And I think that's kind of the things we need to look at in health insurance. I'm doing it, and it's not just for young mobile individuals, but also for the senior citizens in our state as well. Uh, we need to look at some of those type of things. This is what I do and talk to a lot of folks about, is about the health care. It's about the health care insurance and also preparing for in your retirement, how are you going to handle your health care needs. We have an issue here, it's a global issue, it's a state, I mean a countrywide issue here, but here in state we have a people, a growing population, it's an aging population, how are we helping them with getting that affordability, but also making it more of a marketplace driven so the prices can go down. And that's what we need to we can look at there as well. I think the state needs to be an oversight, but I don't think they should be running a program themselves. Yeah, um, here's where we might have a disagreement because um, in Connecticut, our Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman has really led to the development of an exchange that the rest of the country has looked to as a model. Um, and so we, we do have, our state is in the top five for the most people with health insurance. And that's really important. That affects people's quality of life is, is health care. And we have a lot of health care jobs. Uh, that said, I mean, in Farmington we have Connecticut, and they just had a big disagreement uh, with the state and what their role was going to be in the state exchange. And I'm really proud that the state and Connecticut went to the table and sat down and said, we need to fix this. We need to figure out how we stay on the exchange. And Connecticut, you need to figure out how to help us uh, make a profit. Um, and I, I see them as a really good player. I've been out there to visit that uh, business. They're a big employer in the 5th District. And um, they're just, I believe they have the best of intentions. And we just need to work together. But we also need to make sure that uh, businesses have options. If they come to the exchange, they've got to have options. And so that's happening now, but we've lost some options. So the question is, how do you keep bringing people to the table to keep people insured. Right. And Connecticut is a great company and based here as well as you mentioned, but what about the bigger companies that were, were in the program and now have left the program mm -hmm. because the costs and the mandates that are required by the state is not making it, making allowing them to have a profit on that. And they, they're in business to make a profit so they can get it back into the community. Right, I think that's the balance is the cost of care, the profit, how do we get people insured and, and what's the balance? And I think that's being worked out. And hopefully in Washington, they can start to put their heads together in a bipartisan way and fix the Affordable Care Act um, so that we can, it will help the states uh, solve some of these challenges. All right. Let's talk a little bit about campaign finance laws. Do you feel that our campaign finance laws and system are appropriately structured and implemented? And if not, why not? Um, I think the biggest problem right now is the, um, the ruling of Citizens United because it has allowed super PACs to come into states and at the federal level and there's money that can be spent that nobody knows who's spending it and I just think we need an open system. Um, I do believe in campaign finance and the system that we have in Connecticut. I think it's working pretty well. Uh, it's not perfect but uh, it's, I think it limits the impact, but as it's changed over the past five years, because of Citizens United, um, the PACs have too much influence in my mind. Well, I got to tell you, when, when Nationwide, uh, when I approached Nationwide about running for, for this office, um, they were ecstatic about it was Connecticut because of the, the campaign financing laws that we do have. So for my government relations, my office of ethics, they found that it was great for that because of what we have here. Uh, what was surprising to me is the amount of money that we do receive to, to run a campaign. And um, I think in times that we've had in the last couple of years, I think that we should have looked at lowering that amount of money for a state senate campaign and spending the money. Um, that you're was you're referencing to us. the clean elections program, correct, correct. and you're both participating, mm -hmm. correct, in yes. the clean elections Absolutely. program. Absolutely, it's um, you know I like the way it's set up, but I think the amount of money that was could have been used to lessen the blow for some cuts to hospitals and some uh, abuse centers doing that one for that and also the legislative mailers that are all part of that whole process. I mean, that's something we need to look at in tough times is making those cuts versus some of the other things that we've done. But it's a very strong process. I think uh, the influence is limited here for us, um, whether at the representative level or at the state senate level. So I think it's a great program to have. We just need to monitor it, but also look at the levels that were offered within that program. Do you agree with that, Beth? Would you uh, lower the levels, or do you think that they are I am not opposed to reducing it uh, 
myself. I think it could be less. I agree. All right. We have time for uh, one final question uh, before the closing statements. And I'd like to know uh, why you would like to be the state senator for the 5th District. Well, I would like to be the state senator for the 5th District because I think it's a, we need change. I think um, the way that we've been going and looking at a number of different things over the last six plus years, I think it's time we need a change. I think change can bring innovation and opportunity. And um, with regards to our fiscal discipline, and that's been my, with my economics and working in the financial services industry, I think we can bring some of those type of questions together and looking at collaboratively and how we work in, and address those, those issues. But we need, to, we need to tighten our belt. I feel that the government needs to be smaller and smarter, and we need to provide for the private sector to grow, grow and develop. Um, we've been losing jobs, and we've talked a little bit about this, but we've had a net loss of jobs and employees and residents leaving the state. I want to change that, and I think part of that would be having a different, fresh perspective. Um, I've never run before, and coming at it from a business perspective, I think will allow it. Beth has done a great job over the last 10 years um, in advocating for the district. I just feel that we just need more of a financial backing. And Beth, why do you want to continue to be the state senator for well, the 5th Well, I've just, I've just loved representing this community. It is, at the capital, uh, folks say is, you have more calls and emails than anyone in the state. And I really think that makes me a better, more responsive policymaker because we have such an engaged community. It's part of why I moved here. It's part of why I'm still here. And I've been standing up for you when you call and you say, I think you should support this or not support this. I, I, I really listen. Um, I feel like I've been able to affect positive change. I went to the opening of Charter Oak School. It was the most exciting things. I was able to watch gay marriage come into effect, something that I worked on, civil rights, human rights. Um, and I feel like uh, working on bioscience and that initiative for my region is one of the most exciting things I've worked on as well. Eight hours, the Republicans fought us and said we shouldn't do this. And now uh, we have one of the best bioscience uh, sectors in the country. and. We're growing. Those are the kind of jobs we need, and it's been cool to be a part of that change in Connecticut. Great. Well, now each candidate will offer a two-minute closing statement. The order for the closing statements was also determined by lottery prior to the beginning of the debate. And first off, we have Mark Merritt. Great. Again, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity here today, and, and thank you, Beth, uh, for the great conversation we've had tonight. And I, I think, you know, with being in this state, in this town for the last 23 years and seeing the change that has occurred, um, I, I know we can do better. I know we can do more. And I just want us to be in a better fiscal foundation to help do a lot of the social programs that we want to accomplish here in the state. And I would like to have that opportunity to, to be your voice for that as we move forward with the tough times that are upon us with regards to the budgeting and the spending that we've, we've incurred over the last number of years. Um, it's important for me that um, my daughter can come back to the state and giving this town to create a, a living for herself. And I want that to happen. And I want to be able to, to do that over the next four years to create that environment, to dr drive more opportunities, small business owners, as well as medium business owners too, to create more jobs as well as higher wages. I think right now we're at a critical point. Uh, a lot of conversations have to happen and a lot of tough decisions have to be made as to how we fund and how we provide to our, the town, the district, and support the items that are important to us uh, as residents. And so that is why I'm looking to be uh, your state senator. Uh, so thank you. All right, thank you. And next, Beth Bai. Uh, thanks, Deborah. Uh, thank you to the league and the moderators. Um, I'll say that in my time as a nonprofit manager, I've learned it's really important to see the challenges before you, but then to lean on your strengths develop a vision, and move forward with positive energy and believing in yourselves. I've tried to bring this to policymakers. Connecticut has really big challenges recovering from this financial services recession. With state help and an innovative, hardworking workforce, Connecticut has pivoted and grown new industries. But it takes time. It takes time, and it's taken a while for Connecticut to turn around. We have a growing um, innovation economy. And recently, three large manufacturers have chosen to stay in Connecticut because of our great workforce that comes from our great schools. We need to keep those investments coming. Unemployment is down across the 5th District, three percentage points. Housing prices are on the rise. And young families continue to settle here because of our quality of life. The state budget has had major problems over the past four years, no doubt. And we've done the tough work of balancing that budget. Many other states facing similar problems balance the budget by cutting aid to cities and towns. If Connecticut did that, we might have 
budget surpluses, but you'd be paying higher property taxes. Instead, we increased funding to towns for schools and roads. We cut the car tax. We made structural cuts to bring the state's budget into balance for this year and beyond. My father was a teacher, and we had this model of public service, and it's just been an honor to uh, work in public service for you. For six years, I've advocated for you in the state senate for jobs, for great schools, I fought the big guys, the NRA, Comcast, MDC. I've supported civil rights and human rights. And when you've called my office, we've helped you to solve problems. I feel like in my time, I've helped our community. And I ask for your vote so I can keep standing up for you and keep supporting our community to be the great place that it is today. Well, thank you both very, very much. Uh, thank you so much for participating in this exchange of ideas, which I think has really helped to educate the residents of our town and inform their decision making in November. And thank you to WHC-TV, to the League Timers, and to all of you for watching. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Deb. Okay. Thank you.